Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kathleen Fairfax. I'm the Vice Provost for International Affairs here at Colorado State University. And before we begin our program this evening, I would like to have your attention to take a few minutes for our land acknowledgement statement. Colorado State University acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations and peoples. This was also a site of trade, gathering, and healing for numerous other native nations. We recognize the indigenous peoples as original stewards of this land and all the relatives within it. As these words of acknowledgement are spoken and heard, the ties nations have to their traditional homelands are renewed and reaffirmed. CSU is a land-grant institution and we accept that our mission must encompass access to education and inclusion. And significantly, that our founding came at a dire cost to Native nations and peoples whose land this university was built upon. This acknowledgement is the education and inclusion we must practice in recognizing our institutional history, responsibility, and commitment. So we are extremely honored today to have Masi Alenejad on campus with us. And this program is a joint effort between the Office for Inclusive Excellence and the Office of International Programs. And as many of you might imagine, putting on an event like this can sometimes feel like it does take a village. And we have worked very hard on this and we think it's a great opportunity for the campus and the community to hear from a speaker who has a very important message to share. But besides international programs and inclusive excellence, a lot of other units were important sponsors for this event this evening. And these sponsors include ASCSU, Ethnic Studies, Libraries, Journalism and Media Communication Studies, University Marketing and Communications, and Women and Gender Advocacy Centers. So we greatly acknowledge and appreciate the support that we've received from all of these centers and individuals and groups to make this event possible. I would like to invite a colleague of mine from the Office for Inclusive Excellence up to the stage. Uh, Hiba Abdajalil currently serves as Student Success Coordinator for the Asian Pacific American Cultural Center. And Hiba is going to provide the introduction and bio for our speaker this evening. Thank you, Hiba. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Hiba. I use they, them pronouns, and I'm the Student Success Coordinator at the Asian Pacific American Cultural Center. Um, I'd also like to give some context that the Asian Pacific um, American Cultural Center were also big contributors and collaborators for this event, which is why I'm here. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> Um, so I'll start off with our introduction. So I'll give some context to Masi's and her bravery as well. So Masi Alinejad is an Iranian American journalist and women's rights activist who gained worldwide attention when she removed her veil or hijab um, and posted a photo on her Facebook page, like standing proudly with her hair, like and the, the hair, sorry, the, the wind blowing in her hair as well. <laughs> and as you can tell, that her hair, I would say, was her best feature as well. <laughs> um, so from that, my selfie freedom was born. Her vibe social media campaign against the um, compulsory hijab that became the biggest civil um, civil disobedience movement in the history of the Islamic Republic. Um, so today it almost has about 11 million followers. Um, Iranian authorities responded violently, arresting protesters and viol violating their rights while in custody. 
um, Alinajad continues to oppose the compulsory hijab and to speak out in defense of her fellow activists. Um, she is one of the most prominent and vocal um, opposition figures challenging the Islamic, Repub uh, Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, she offers valuable insights into the unfolding protests in Iran and what it means in the U.S. foreign policy. I think just fun fact through her, I actually learned that a lot of her work is what we call citizenship um, journalism. So I've learned a lot about that and I've done more research. So it's kind of cool to see that she advocates for those citizen um, journalism as well. Um, described by the New York Times as the woman whose hair frightens Iran, um, Ali Najad wrote the widely acclaimed best-selling memoir, The Wind in My Hair, which you can uh, purchase outside if you're if you're welcome if you're wanting to, um, sharing her extra, extraordinary story about living in exile, leaving her country, challenging tradition, and sparking change, um, an inspiring account about political activism, family, heritage, overcoming adversity, and more. Alinejad op offers a compelling and shocking look at the realities of the world we live in. So Ali Najad has a long history of activism. It started off when she was living in a tiny village in Iran, um, in a traditional family. She didn't understand why girls were virtually banned from doing any, from doing pretty much anything, whereas the boys had freedom to do whatever they pleased. Um, so uh, <laughs> to get around it, she kind of made a deal with her brother, which is actually a funny story. I hopefully you can listen here. Um, she made a deal that he would teach her how to swim, how to ride a bike, um, in exchange that he, uh, she would walk to, her, she would walk with him to the outside house since he was scared of the dark. Um, <laughs> so that small guest gesture really changed her life and as she tasted the freedom of to do what she wanted, she became politically active um, and began fighting for human rights, um, which led her to being kicked out of high school, college, parliament, and even her own country. Um, her story is a tale of overcoming adver adversity and discrimination. Her commitment to human rights has won her the UN Watch International Women's Rights Awards, the AIB Media Award, Excellence Awards, a lot of words, <laughs> um, the Swiss Free Thinkers Association's Free Thinker Prize and the American Jewish Committee's Moral Courage Award, among other honors. Um, Ali Najad currently lives in New York City, in exile in New York City. So please help me welcome Masi. Unbelievable! Unbelievable! Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. You know what, before even starting my uh, presentation, I want to tell you that whew, for years and years I have been campaigning against compulsory hijab, and um, it's an honor. A woman choose to wear hijab, giving introduction about my campaign. This is what I love about America. especially for years and years, being labeled that Massey causes Islamophobia because Massey say no to compulsory a job. So I am here to tell you that my dream is to walk shoulder to shoulder with my mother who wears a job in my beloved country, Iran, without being beaten up, without being humiliated, without receiving lashes. And that's the dream we all Iranians have been fighting to have dignity, to have freedom of choice, and to choose our own lifestyle. So thank you for actually reminding me of my sister, my mother, and those inside Iran, when wearing hijab and saying, Ba hijab bi hijab, pish With or without hijab, let's overthrow gender apartheid. Thank you, Colorado University, State University, for inviting me. I'm very excited, especially this is my first time here. And I experienced the town. I need more time. Please invite me back again. <laughs> I'm very, very honored being among you, especially before coming here. I had the pleasure to meet with students, Iranian community. They gave me energy to come here and pass their messages to you as well. They, me, and millions of Iranians, we need you to be our voice against one of the most dangerous virus, which is called Islamic Republic. My name is Masih Ali Najad. I'm an Iranian journalist, women's rights activist, and of course I'm a troublemaker for the oppressors everywhere. Yes. 
In the eyes of Iranian regime, we, the women who want to be free, we are master criminals. How many women are here? Hands up. Yes, you are all master criminals. Yes, you are. You are. Because if you don't cover yourself, in the eyes of clerics in Iran, you are committing crime. If you dare to sing, you're committing another crime. If you dare to ride a bicycle, another crime. Women in Iran are not allowed to get a passport without getting permission from their husband. Women are not allowed to ride a bicycle. Women are not allowed to get a job or travel abroad without getting permission from their husband. So that is why in my beloved country, Iran, women are either second-class citizen or they are master criminals. We choose second one because we, if we want to be free, we have to break the law every single day. I mean, when Haba mentioned about my story and my brother's story, I have to tell you that through our educational system, we never learned about equality. Through our books, media, state TV, all the state-owned broadcasting, we learn to be second-class citizen. That's all we know. So that is why I often get this question that who teach you from the age of seven to be a rebel? I tell the story of my brother. I share the story of my brother. My brother was only two years older than me. He was the prince during the day in the village because he was able to enjoy himself, to jump in a beautiful river, to swim, to go to stadium, to play with boys around, to ride a bicycle, to sing, to show his hair, to do whatever he wanted. But me, as a little girl, I just realized that from the age of seven, if I don't cover this massive hair, <laughs> I won't be able to go to school. I won't be able to get an education. I won't exist if I don't cover my hair. But I didn't know how to fight for it. I was just envying at my freedom, at my brother's freedom from early age. So what I did, I learned that I need my brother to be my ally to gain my freedom back. Because I couldn't go to the government, I couldn't go to the school principal, but I had him just next to me. So what I did, I grew up in a very tiny village, very poor family. I mean, in the village, uh, I'm 46 years old. So imagine when I was seven years old, we didn't have running water, we didn't have electricity inside, we didn't even have inside bathroom, we, we had outhouse. The bathroom was in the outhouse backyard garden. And during the night, it was very, very scary to use the outhouse. And I was the one um, scared, of, scared of the darkness. I mean, as a little girl, it was natural. Um, my mom, actually, who's not even able to read and write, she told me a lesson. She said that darkness is like a monster. If you're scared of the darkness, then the darkness can swallow you all. The darkness can devour you. But instead of being scared of the darkness, if you open your eyes as wide as you can, if you stare into the darkness, then the darkness will disappear. So as a kid, I thought this is a fact. And I used to open my eyes as wide as I could <laughs> to use the outhouse. And it worked. It worked. So for me and millions of other women in Iran, darkness is the Monster is the Islamic Republic. Discrimination. All the discrimination that we experience is like a darkness. So I used this tactic. My brother, the prince of the village, who was scared of the darkness during the night, he couldn't go to the outhouse. I used my power. I told him the lesson actually this you said. I told him that, OK, there is a deal. Every night I take you to the outhouse. But every day, you have to take me to ride a bicycle. You have to actually take me to a stadium. You have to teach me to enjoy my freedom where I am banned from all those activities that you take it for granted. So I used my personal story to encourage other men, other girls, 
to be allies because the Islamic Republic knows very well to make men against women. They're telling us that men own their sisters, men own their daughter, men own their mothers. So according to the law in Iran, if men kill his daughter, receive eight years prison sentence. But if a woman removed her hijab, received 24 years prison sentence. Or like Mahsa Amini, she was only 22 years old. She got killed in the hand of morality police when she was only 22 years old. And if you don't know what morality police is, I'm gonna tell you. Bunch of police officers walking around in the streets in 21st century and telling women, cover yourself properly. If you don't, you receive lashes, you go to jail, you get kicked out from everywhere, or you are like Mahsa Amini. I will get back to you. I know that I got invited to talk about the power of personal story and my book and, and my history, but I'm, I have to talk about the revolution which is taking place in Iran right now. But before going to that, I want to tell you that why the power of saying no is important in Iran and why Iranian women decided to say no. There is a famous expression in my country, Iran, that if you want to tell Iranian women to do something, tell them not to do. <laughs> because they do it anyway. So we have to break the laws every single day to be our true self. This is how we gain our freedom and dignity back. So as a journalist, I was a parliamentary journalist, and um, there were so many red lines. I know that in the West, the Iranian regime were you know, very, very sophisticated to tell the narrative uh, that you know, there are reformist group, and there are conservative group, and there are people who are trying to bring reform within the society. I and millions of other people were part of it and believed that we were brainwashed that we can reform this regime. Taliban cannot be reformed, no? ISIS cannot be reformed. Islamic Republic is the same. When I was a parliamentary journalist, there were so many red lines, so many barriers. We were not even able to ask a single question about nuclear activities, or the supreme leader of Iran, or compulsory job, and our bodies. So I remember that I actually asked, any time when I were asking critical questions, difficult questions, I was told by every single member of parliament that first cover yourself, then ask a question. This expression is something that every single woman heard in Iran. First cover yourself, whatever you want to do. You're asking questions? You want to like, go to a restaurant? You want to do shopping? Whatever you want to do, you have to first cover yourself. And this is how we feel like humiliated. So as a parliamentary journalist, um, like, many, like many other women, I was scared to ask this question. But the day when one of the cleric came to me, said that first cover yourself, and I got really scared and I was trying to cover myself. And then I found out that it was just a tiny bit of my hair. Wow. Then I felt the power and I said, for this, because the, the cleric told me, I'm going to punch you on your face if you don't cover yourself. And I said, for that much of my hair, punch me. Punch me on my face. So when you're loud, they are scared of you. So he couldn't, but he was catched by all the cameras. And that was the moment I gained my power to tell the clerics no, to tell them that I'm going to be my true self. Punch me. I mean, many times they do it, but this is how I gain my power. So I had another interview with the former president of Iran, Khatami. And I asked difficult questions again. I asked him that, why women are banned from singing solo? First of all, can you believe that? Women are banned from singing. Can you believe that? Come on. Yeah, yeah, this, this is it. This is it. If you sing, men cannot control themselves they can get excited, they might rape you. Yeah, this is the logic. Honestly, this is the logic. That's why I got furious. And I asked the former president of Iran, have you ever heard of a woman singing? 
because I wanted to see whether you get excited. <laughs> yeah, I asked him, have you ever heard of a woman singing? And he said, um, you know, I heard women citing Quran. And I said, no, 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 that's different. Singing. He said, no. So what did I do? جوان می زنم به روی زخم بر تنم فقط به حکم بودنم که من زنم 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 چو هم صدا شویم و پا به پای هم رویم و هستم رها شویم That's it! That's it! Yeah. <laughs> but, but people, people this is the song actually, right now, when Iranian women sing this, they feel powerful. It means that I am wounded, but I'm going to blossom on my wounds. And this is actually, um, this is a very powerful song, but this revolution, which is uh, started right after the brutal death of Mahsa Amini, uh, many women and men got united and they took to the streets across Iran, more than 100 cities, and they were protesting against not only compulsory hijab, clearly against the whole regime. And the, the response from the Islamic Republic, they killed more than 500 innocent protesters. They arrested more than 22,000 protesters for the crime of peacefully protesting, peacefully demanding freedom and dignity. They sentenced 50 of the innocent protesters to death, and they hanged five of them. Many women and men, young protesters, were blinded because the Islamic Republic Revolutionary Guards shot them in their eyes. Ghazal, Nilufar, Mercedes, Kosar, Saman, Hossein. When you go to their page, you see that. They write this. You can take our eyes away. You can take our body. You can take our life, but not our hope. And these are my heroes. One of the women actually drew a beautiful flower on her wound. And they, she published a video on her own Instagram. So four years ago, when I had a talk at Stanford University. The headline of my talk was, next revolution will be led by women. Just a few people took me serious that time. Because when I launched my campaign, many people were actually hesitating to touch the issue. People were saying that compulsory hijab is part of the culture of the Middle East. And that is why we don't want to touch the issue. Believe me. Calling a barbaric law part of our culture, this is an insult to a nation. Yeah. Eight years ago, in two, when I actually launched my campaign called My Selfie Freedom, I didn't have any plan to launch a campaign. It was just uh, me publishing a simple photo of myself running in a beautiful street full of blossoms. And the caption was so simple. I said that anytime when I run in a free country and I feel the wind in my hair, it just reminds me of the time when this massive hair was like a hostage in the hands of Iranian regime. Then I got a lot of comments from Iranian envying at my freedom from compulsory hijab. Soon after, I found another picture of myself. It was me running, uh, no, that time not running driving towards my hometown, but unveiled. The picture was taken inside Iran. So I published that picture, and I said to Iranian women that, you know, we the women, we know how to bypass the morality police. We know how to create the moment of the freedom that we want to. So I know all of you have stealthy freedom, secret freedom, like guilty pleasure, you know. That. And I said to them, you, you want to share it with me? I got bombarded by photos and videos of women walking unveiled, which is a punishable crime. Soon after, I shifted this online movement to offline, White Wednesdays. I picked a color, white, which was a symbol of uh, peace to me. And I picked a day, 
Wednesday because I had more free time at Wednesday. <laughs> so, and I ask women and men wear white symbol or hold a white headscarf in public to identify each other. Because this is how you find that you're not alone. You feel more powerful when you feel there are a lot of people believe that they have to be free. But after that, the Iranian regime, the morality police started to arrest women, to bully them, to harass them in public. And I was like, I have to do something about it. So um, 29 women got arrested, only in one day. And I was like, this is it. I have to shut down the campaign. Because miles away from Iran, watching that my sisters and young women were part of White Wednesday's campaign getting arrested, and I didn't know what to do. I was about to shut down the campaign. But one of the women who got a Sabah court Afshari was only 19 years old. She received 24 years prison sentence, and I felt guilty. I felt the burden on my shoulder. I was about to you know, announce that uh, no longer you, you know, the campaign White Wednesdays exist. I received video from Sabah's mother saying that from now on, I am the voice of my daughter. Yasaman Aryani, the same. Her mother joined her. Mujgan Keshavars, Fereshte, Raha, Hanane, and these are the women of suffragists in Iran. These are the Rosa Parks of Iran. So why I'm sharing this story for you? Because I was challenged outside Iran that many journalists and activists were telling me that um, so you are miles away from Iran, you're safe, and you're putting people in danger. This is called victim blaming. And what happened when I was sharing the story of these women, that now the older generation are joining the young generation and saying, together we are stronger, together we're going to bring this regime down. Still, they didn't believe me. Now, the whole world is paying attention to woman life freedom in Iran. But believe me, it didn't need for Nika Shah Karami, only 16 year old to get killed, for the whole world to wake up and understand that they have to support their sisters. It didn't need for Sari now, only 17 year old to get killed. It didn't need for Siavash, only 17 year old to get killed. So that is why I strongly believe that we always have options to wait for people to be victims, to get killed, to get death, or be the target of acid attack, chemical attack, to be their voices, or when they are the warriors, we can echo their voices. When people were receiving bullies and harassment in public, I had to find a way. So that happened to me. Even miles away from Iran, I was not safe. Not just because of the backlash, which I'm gonna, I listed. I'm, I don't want to focus on myself, but I want to tell you what happened to me. First, the Iranian regime put my brother in prison for two years to punish me. Then they interrogated my mother for two hours. My mother wears a job. She has nothing to do with my campaign against compulsory job. But they stopped her from sharing her love with me to punish me. They brought my sister on TV to denounce me publicly. I was watching my sister for 17 minutes on TV. I was broken. And she, she had different belief, but when they brought her on TV to denounce me, I was like, this is the first time I see my sister in a good quality. I tried to see the positive side. <laughs> they brought more than 10 women on TV, 10 women of White Wednesday's campaign. One of them, with bruise on her face, denouncing me and saying that regret, I, may, I, I shouldn't send videos to Massey. And recently, another woman, Sefida Rashno, they brought her on TV because she filmed the morality police, because she was so brave and powerful, they didn't want her to be an example for the rest of the, 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 the society. So they brought her on TV, and she denounced me. So they did all of these things to stop the campaign. That didn't work. What they did, they made a law saying that if anyone sends videos to Massey, will be charged up to 10 years prison. So don't send videos to me. <laughs> but they didn't know that Iranian women, now they don't need me. All of them, they became their own leader. All the women 
that you see now, they became their own storytellers. They became their own media. When you go to the social media, you see mothers of those people who got killed. Now, they are leading the revolution. One example, Nahid Shirpisha. She was with her son, Puya Bakhtiari, in the, in, in the protest, in the street, hand in hand. When the tear gas was thrown to them, Nahid lost her son. 10 minutes later, she saw the dead body of her son in front of her eyes. How many of you are mothers here? How would you feel? Miserable, no? But Nahid made the Islamic Republic feel miserable. And these are, these are the true example of feminism. These are the true example of leaders trying to bring change within the society. And that is why I am here today to tell you that never say, shh, we don't want to save people in the Middle East. Believe me, we the people of Iran, we never want the Western government to save us. We want them to stop save our murderers. And the word, the word safe is too luxury for all of us here, for all of us. They were, they've been using for me many times, challenging uh, me and saying on media, different media, that you're putting the lives of women in danger in Iran. And uh, now I am being the target of kidnapping plot. Recently, a man with loaded gun got arrested in front of my house in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. And that actually shows you when we, the people of Iran, are fighting against Islamic Republic, we are fighting to save the rest of the world from one of the most dangerous virus, which is called Islamic ideology. We deserve to have a secular democracy. We deserve to have, uh, you know, freedom dignity, equality, fair and free election. But that's not about us. When we fight against Islamic Republic, it means that an Iran without Islamic Republic can make the whole world a safer place. First, they cannot export their extremist ideology around the world. Second, the Revolutionary Guards, which kills innocent people in Iran, they shut down the internet two years ago, in bloody November. Only in three days, they killed 1,500 innocent protesters. This, this, the same government who banned 80 million people from using social media, who shut down the internet, they are welcomed on social media with verified account. So that is why I'm saying that we want the tech companies to kick the dictators out from social media. And you can help us. You can echo the voice of Iranian people and write to the tech companies with different hashtags that this is the time when dictators are not allowing their own people to use freedom of speech. They must be kicked out from social media. Yeah. My time? Do I have time? Another thing that we, we want, we Iranian people want from you, we want the US government to understand that the, the Islamic Republic does not understand the language of diplomacy. They only understand the language of pressure. Right now that I'm talking to you, the US citizen, UK citizen, Swedish citizen, German citizen, French citizen, Belgian citizen, citizen from all over the world, they are in Iranian prison and they are being used like bargaining chip to get nuclear deal. So they understand only hostage diplomacy. 40 years ago, they took American diplomats hostage. Yes, they released them all, but they still have 80 million innocent Iranians hostage. And when we don't bow, we the Iranians don't bow to the hostage diplomacy, we want the leaders of democratic countries to follow our path. My brother is hostage. There are many students here that I met them today from Iran. They're all studying their PhD here. They are the future of not only Iran, they are the future of the world. Their family members are like hostage in Iran. 
So I am calling President Biden, President Macron, Prime Minister Mark Rutte, and the leaders of democratic country, be as brave as Iranian people and do not bow to the hostage takers. Downgrade your diplomatic relation and ask Iranian regime to release all innocent political prisoners. That is how we all get united and stand for democracy. I know I have only five minutes. I know I have only five minutes, but I want to end this for a personal story. And I want to tell you that how much you are powerful. Because a lot of people are actually telling me that what can we do here? We don't have the power. We don't have the you know, voice or the same platform that you have. When I received a death threat, um, there was a well-known Basiji, which in, in Iran we call him Dahan Goshad. I don't know how to translate that. <laughs> I don't know. Big mouth, big mouth Basiji. So he, he, he threatened me that he's willing to give money to anyone in America who dared to butcher me, who dared to uh, cut my tongue. And it was my tongue or my chest as well, I think. To send it to my family. I know that I, I try to make jokes. I try to, to use sense of humor to show them that you're disgusting, but you cannot scare me. I'm not scared of you. So what I did, I went to the Islamic Republic interest section in Washington, DC to make an official complaint. I knew that they're not going to do anything, but I wanted to make a scene, yes. I went to Islamic Republic interest section in Washington, DC to make an official complaint. And guess what happened? They didn't let me in. They said that first cover yourself, then come in. I said, wait a minute. You must be kidding me. The reason that I received death threat is just because I'm fighting against compulsory a job. That actually shows you, even in America, on US soil, my hair is much more important than my existence. And what I did, I did the same thing that the Iranian women inside the country do. I practiced my civil disobedience. I took my camera, and I ran after um, you know, the guy who was saying that I'm going to call the Secret Service to arrest you. I said, wait a minute. For 40 years, you were calling America great Satan. Now you're calling the great Satan Secret Service to save yourself from an unveiled Iranian woman. <laughs> yes, that's our power. Let's be united. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm not used to it. I often get nasty messages, death threat. I need this love. I dedicated this to Iranian women. Women, life, freedom. Women, life, freedom. Women, life, freedom. Thank you. Wow, huge number of Iranians. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm, I'm, uh, I was told that I can answer questions. Guys, you can ask difficult questions. I survived assassination plot, kidnapping plot. So I'm not as scared of difficult questions, but be nice with me. <laughs> Should, these, uh, these are... Uh, yeah, the microphone is over there. Except if you're as loud as me, you don't need microphone. Exactly. Yes, Jana. Hey, Jana. So you have to translate it. Go on. جدیدان درباره خالی کردن سطل ماست روی سر بانوان هم یه اشاره ای بکنید. چشم. من قربونتون بشم. Merci. Merci. Actually, yeah, that's, 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 uh, wow. Wow. You know, for years and years, Aga Yagubi, Aga Yagubi, John, for years and years, huh? Oh, I'm going to actually, he, he asked me to mention about something which happened recently in Iran. There were two morality police. They actually attacked women, putting yogurt on women's hair because she was unwell. And now she. There were mother and daughter. Both of them were resisting compulsory job, and they, uh, you know, threw yogurt in in their hair. 
and he said that I love it when you actually, as a man, saying to, to uh, actually reminding me to mention about that. For years and years, when I was talking about this, a lot of people were saying that, you know, Middle East has got so many bigger problems. Bigger problems. I mean, I'm, I was like, how come? I, I want to ask a simple question here. How many of you, before coming here, you used mirror to make yourself beautiful? How many of you? All of you. You care about your identity. You care about your hair. You care about your appearance. You care about your true self. And imagine the people telling you that, no, this is a small issue. We, the women of Iran, use mirror to make ourselves the one that the government wants us to be. That is ugly. And when it comes to women's body here in America, my body, my choice, everyone says that, yes, this is very progressive a slogan. But immediately when it comes to women in the Middle East, my body, my choice, some of the high representative of European Parliament, the female politicians, they go to my beautiful country and they say, well, now my body is the choice of clerics. My body is Mullah's choice. My body is Taliban's choice. No. This is what we deal in Iran. Women not only getting kicked out from a school, daily basis they face harassment, bullied in the streets. Yes, this time was yogurt, but the other time was acid. Women were the target of acid attack. What happened? Those who thrown acid on women's face, they are free. They can walk around. But those who protested against acid attack, like Nargis Mohammadi, is still in prison. And thank you so much for, for reminding me of that. Thank you. Any question? If anyone wants to ask a question, you can stand like here, and then I can see you. Yeah, thank you for being here, first of all. Um, I'm a faculty here at Colorado State University, so I have this uh, question for you. Um, it seems that um, most of the Western countries, including the U.S., um, you know, they pretend that they sympathize with Iranian people, and they support Iranian people, but you know, on the backside, on the, you know, behind the curtains, uh, they would love to make deals with the with the current government. So my question is, uh, based on your experience, uh, you've met with uh, many, you know, foreign leaders, Western leaders, and so forth. So, based on your experience, uh, and in particular the experience here. Uh, do you see any hope that they may change their attitude eventually? And uh, my second part of the question is that, have you had any luck with the Biden government? Difficult question. <laughs> but thank you so much for actually uh, raising this. Um, you know what? The Islamic Republic took everything away from us. Everything. Our family, homeland our beloved one, our dignity. I miss my family. But not hope. <clears throat> Can I have water? But not hope. So I have hope that we can convince the leaders of democratic country that if you don't support us, then you have to face the terrorists on US soil. In my meeting with the leaders of democratic countries, I was very, very clear, and I want you to help me, to put pressure on the leaders of democratic countries. I definitely need water. <laughs> and I lost my voice as well. That this is the unique sense of uh, unity. For the first time, we see that many well-known athletes, actress, female politicians, they show their solidarity with the women of Iran. But you know what? Solidarity is beautiful, but we don't need empty words. Solidarity itself is not sufficient. It's beautiful when I see actress, athletes, they cut their hair to make awareness, but I am very loud and clear. We don't need the female politicians to cut their hair. We want them to cut their ties with our murderers. And you can do a lot to help me to get this done. It's not easy, but we have to be clear that if they bury human rights under nuclear deal, 
we, the people, are there um, to put pressure on them, if we really care about democracy. Look, I want to actually say that by using an, as a, as, as an using example. I want to beg you all, when it comes to the rights of women in the Middle East, see this as bipartisan issue. It doesn't matter whether you're a Republican or Democrat, you're left or liberal. It really doesn't matter because the Islamic Republic hate America. They hate democracy. When they want to come after you and kill you, they never ask whether you're a Republican or Democrat. They kill you anyway. <laughs> so the example, when um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a village girl, so I grow, uh, I grow vegetables, you know, tomato, cucumber, basils, mint, and I feed the whole neighborhood in Brooklyn with my beautiful vegetables. <laughs> so I use, uh, uh, you know, my garden's cucumber. I make pickles, and I offer pickles to all my neighbors. You know what happened? The day when I was the target of uh, assassination plot, the day when my brother got arrested, the day when the news were everywhere, CNN, Fox News, all the media were talking about an American Iranian journalist were the target of assassination plot. A man with loaded gun got arrested in front of my house. That was the day when all my neighbors, one of them had the sign of supporting President Trump, the other was supporting Biden and Kamala, the other one Bernie Sanders. But all of them, they were the one coming to my house and offering me food, red wine, support, hug. So for them, it didn't matter whether I'm Republican or left or liberal. For me, it didn't matter who they support. They were all united when it comes to the national security of the United States of America. But I believe pickle diplomacy works as well. <laughs> yes. So I offer you pickles. <laughs> Thank you so much. Jana. شما هم خیار شور درست کنین بدین به امریکایی که حمایت کنن. I had written some difficult questions, but you're worthy of much better than that. Your voice, you just lost your voice. I loved your persona two, three months ago when you also lost your voice because you had talked all day. You still kept on talking. Okay. And I love that. I need a hug now. Can you believe that? <coughs> Hugging men and women is forbidden in Iran. <laughs> I mean, we're coming from, I mean, I cannot even believe that. That's why I don't get it when President Biden don't understand that we don't want you actually to uh, bring democracy for us. But we deserve freedom, you know? We cannot, if we hug like this in Iran, we get lashes. If we attend mixed party, we get lashes. If this is not gender apartheid regime, then what do you call it? What do you call it? So that is why, believe me, we the people of Iran, President Biden, we are better allies than those backward mullahs. Thank you so much. Can I have my mic? Yes, go on. <laughs> so anyway, 50 years ago, before you were born, we had another gutsy lady in Iran, poetess, Farooq Farrokhzad, and she was, downplayed, talked down to anything, simply because she was writing a poem about how she loved her man. I mean, even the intellectual, the ones who called themselves intellectual. I was a teenager there, and then and there. Uh, I want to share with you something along what you are doing, and she was saying, then, دست هایم را در باغچه می کارم سبز خواهم شد می دانم می دانم می دانم I plant my hands in the garden I will grow I know I know I know So I wrote a little thing about that night that you had lost your voice and you kept talking and you can pass it. it to me. Well, I want to read it okay. and then I can get, it's got all kind of scratch marks on it because I was changing it as you were talking. Your tired voice 
that night, barely held standing, but by leaning on the shoulders of your anger, brought me tears of reverence and a reminder of the common pain we all share. In the morning I began, I lit a match that I had in my pocket and a candle which I bought from the corner store, thinking that maybe one day this woman, that man, will hold hands together and do the same thing I am doing. And maybe, just maybe, our children will have a better lighted road ahead. I am hopeful. I plant my hands in the garden. I will grow. I know, I know, I know. Thank you so much, Aziz. And I hope you grow. We will. 2,000 we feet will. tall. We will. Zan Zendegi Azadi. Woman, life, freedom. Woman, life, freedom. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I'm a badass. Don't worry. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to win this battle alongside all Iranian men and women shoulder to shoulder. I mean, honestly, my people are wounded, but they are unbreakable. And thank you so much. Thank you. I just want to know how someone as young as I can can join this fight for freedom and can make a difference like you. How old are you? I'm 10. I know. Yes. Please, when a 10-year-old girl asks a question that how I can be part of the change that I want to see in the future, you already actually did your responsibility. Thank you so much. When you care about it, when you feel the responsibility, it even gives me power. You know, in Iran right now, teenagers are getting killed. As I mentioned, Nicole was only 16 years old. I beg you to go and Google their name search and learn about them and be their voices, you know? Uh, a lot of mothers and uh, fathers, parents, like hesitate to make their teenagers involved in political activities, in, uh, you know, no. In Iran and Afghanistan, these are women, girls like your age, they're being kicked out from school and I think you can do a lot by naming them, writing about them, giving speech and lecture among you know, your classmates and make awareness about them. Never say that. I remember recently I saw a young girl and she was like, keep repeating that, I'm not an activist, I'm not an activist, but I did this. I said, you are an activist. So to me, in my eyes, you are an activist. And thank you so much. Please email me, I wanna follow your page. From now on, you can be the voice of Iranian girls and the girls of Afghanistan who actually uh, deserve to go to school. Everywhere I go, I cannot just talk about Iranian women and ignore them. You can be the voice of the girls in Iran and Afghanistan. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Kiana Firfalak was only 10. Okay. <laughs> My heart is pounding as I'm standing here. I'm shivering, honestly, because, whew. firstly, I just want to let you know that how much I admire courage and confidence. I'm from India, and I'm an immigrant myself, an international student, and you're as a woman. Um, I have been fired for standing up against what I believed in, and I have lost all, all my confidence. I admire you because I want to understand, I want to know, how do you fight the system against all the discrimination and hate and the darkness, right? How do you find hope in the dark times, mm. right? Even when the system is trying to crush you, downplay you, where do you get the courage and confidence? Because there have been days I have not been able to even get up from the bed. It's that hard. How do you do it? Same, same sister. Never think that I'm a like, you know, Superman or Superwoman, not at all. I had the same day that, the day when I was trying to save one of the athlete's life who was uh, on the death row. 
Navid Afghari. I did my best. I did my best. I uh, interviewed the family. I actually echoed his voice. I did everything, but I couldn't. The day when I woke up, I heard the news that Navid Afghari was executed. That was the day that uh, all my neighbors realized that, realized that uh, I am a crazy woman because I took all the sunflowers out of my garden. I actually were like screaming, shouting, and I'm, I was like, I'm useless. I couldn't save his life. What's the point that I live in America? I was like acting honestly like, like a crazy woman, like losing control. I didn't know what to do. The day when my brother got arrested, I felt guilty. I felt the burden on my shoulder that this was my, my fault because my niece and my nephew were begging me, if you really care about the life of Ali, then please stop, you know? So I had the guiltiness. I had like, I lost hope. And, but the thing is, every single day when I wake up, I say to myself that, you know, I have only two options. Only two options, to feel miserable or to make my oppressors feel miserable. And I choose the second one, <laughs> honestly. And, and I remember, and I remember, I remember that uh, I said to myself, anytime when I feel bad, I have to tell myself, okay, I have only one life. I'm going to die, maybe in car accident, maybe coronavirus, maybe, I don't know. But how beautiful is when you dedicate your life to your goal. So my sister, it's from me to you. You have only one life. You're going to die anyway. So think about it. You never, you, ha you haven't chosen to be in this world. You're not going to make decision when you're going to leave this world. In between, it's your choice. And if you have a goal, fight for it. And it's beautiful. I only feel hopeless useless when I cannot do anything. And that's why I, I actually fight against the darkness in my life, how I, I actually overcome my fear and, and sorrows, and gardening, make pickles. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Hey, I have six more people here. How I'm going to tell them go back? <laughs> Short, maybe. Uh, well, I, I want to say a couple things. One, uh, maybe every, many here know that Iran has a rich history, yeah. uh, regardless of religion. Uh, and there's many people, uh, Muslim, non-Muslim, that are sort of in exile, right? They can't go back to Iran. Um, and so when I see people like you, I'm excited because I hope one day I can go back to, or I, I can go to Iran. I've never been there, but I hope I can go see where my father's from. Um, so I get excited. It seems like maybe it's possible one day. Um, but I had a question. In, in this post-Islamic republic, right, when it, when it happens, not if, when, um, you hear a lot about uh, Reza Pahlavi, the son of the old Shah, saying he wants to help create the, a democratic government. Do you think he has a place in helping with that, or does it come from the people alone? Is he sort of in the past? That's a very good question because I often get these questions from uh, the leaders of democratic countries and what they want to see that we Iranians um, are um, sophisticated enough to fight back the division that the Islamic Republic created between us. It's not just the Islamic Republic. Putin is good at um, making division between its own opposition. All the dictators, this is what they how they survive, you know, to, to divide us. So for me, yes, he's a, I, I've been in contact with him. We've uh, re re revealed our charter recently, and I believe that he believes in democracy, and that is why we, we all got united, to show the rest of the world, because many times they say that, okay, when the Islamic Republic is, is gone, maybe Iran is going to be like Syria, Iran is going to be like Libya, Iran is going to be a mess. It's our responsibility to show them that you can compare our country to our own history. You can you know, see that we, the people of Iran, are united to bring this regime down. We have to put our difficult uh, political differences aside, and we have to get united based on human rights. What we want is fair and free election. The future, it's 
depends to the people. When we have fair and free election, which you have it for granted here, we don't have election, we have selection in Iran. So this is the day we're gonna celebrate and we're gonna choose the kind of the government that we want to have. Yes, I have hope. Thank you. Thank you. They said only one, one more question, but there are two people. I, 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 yeah. I, I promise I'm gonna be short. To the last uh, question, uh, so you are one of the leaders of opposition uh, against the Islamic Republic outside of Iran, and it's been so heartwarming to see you among other leaders, Reza Pahlavi, Hamid Esmaili, and Nazarin Bonyadi, Golchif, there, giving us this sense of unity, sharing the stage together, sending messages together. Um, one source of frustration is that that unity is sadly not quite reflected in your followings, and we see a lot of infightings on social media. In That's the beauty of opposition. We are practicing democracy. It, Believe me. Yeah, of course. My but brother, this is beautiful. No, 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 no. <laughs> but this, this is the beauty of, uh, for 40 years, we didn't have the opportunity to practice um, our rights to criticize. So I see the positives. Could not agree more, but I believe we can agree that we have one enemy and its name is exactly. Islamic Republic. So how can we bring that sense of unity in the you know, broader, uh, broader sort of opposition in Iran? See Iran as an example. The, for, year, for, year, for 40 years, the Islamic Republic tried to label Kurds, saying that the Kurds are separatists. What happened? The Kurds became the symbol of unity, no? or labeling uh, you know, people different minority. Now from Zahedan, every Friday, they are the one that keep the flame of revolution alive. And I believe that this is the first time in our history we see sense of unity between men and women. You know that how much bad akhlaq I was. I was very angry with men that why you go to a stadium when your sisters are not allowed to go. You remember? This is the unique time we see men and women shoulder to shoulder in Iran. They are united. So we have to actually see these people in Iran, within the country, in front of the Revolutionary Guard, as an example, and practice it here. Criticize each other, but not actually follow the path that the Islamic Republic want to divide us. Together, we are stronger. And the unity is the key word that we have to repeat it. We're going to win this battle together. Yeah. Two. <laughs> Okay, so, okay, uh, thank you. And welcome to beautiful Colorado, and I hope that you will come back later again. Uh, I just uh, say my uh, sentence very quick. I think that uh, the way that you explain the situation in Iran, uh, it's very important, and your strong speech, and I really liked it, and I think everybody here was enjoying that. This is a thing that we still need to be done much more, and I think that the general uh, people, I mean, all, all over the world, people still don't know much about what is happening inside Iran. Yeah. And the politicians, of course, politics is dirty, and politicians are following their own agenda. We cannot expect that they will exactly follow what we want them to do, but when we make the people more aware, it will have the effect on the politics as well. And we need much, much more of the speech that you deliver today, every time and all over the US and all over the world. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. He's right. I don't have anything to add. Thank you so much for coming here and echoing our voice. Yes, come on. It's one, the future of this country. Come on. Um. Uh, I was wondering, you shared a sto the story of only having a little bit of hair showing and just l letting them do whatever they felt they wanted to do. Were you at all scared or nervous when you did that? Or did you feel completely confident? That's a very good question. I mean, how old are you? Uh, 11. 11. Look, um, I remember that. Your parents are here because I, I'm about to teach you how to be a badass. <laughs> are you around? Okay, listen, I love my father.
You know, I love my mother, but um, so because of the educational system, they were brainwashed that they have to take me to heaven by force. And that's why they were pushing me to cover my hair and I didn't want to do it. So I used to take off my hijab when I was leaving home and going to school. So in between, I was just, you know, enjoying my, my freedom. And it was scary because one day I, um, um, I saw my father by accident was like enjoying myself. My father just came to me and then he spat on me. And you know how it was very like my heart was broken. But what I did, immediately I found that, wow, what a power I have. Even my father spat on me. I said that this is me. This is my true self. This is me. And I gained my power back. I said when I can say no to even my father, who I love, I still love him, then I can say no to dictators. So it is a scary. And there are many girls like you, your age in Iran. They are scared of uh, the government as well. They're scared of the social pressure. But they overcome their fear. For me, it was the same. I want to actually tell you another story, and then I'm going to let you go. I was in London. Even in London, there was a man, pro-regime man. He stopped me. So, and he told me that, you ugly woman, you're ruining the image of Iran by publishing the videos of morality police beating up women in the streets. You show the ugly side of uh, our country, and this is how you try to ruin the image of our beloved homeland. And I said, wait a minute. I'm not the one ruining the image of my country. This is the clerics. This is the bad laws. This is the mullahs who lashes people, who kill people, who beaten up people. These are the ones ruining the image of my country, not me and women who resist the bad laws. He was not convinced, but that didn't bother me. What bothered me, he called me ugly woman. <laughs> because look, I knew that in the eyes of my mom, I'm the beautiful daughter ever. In the eyes of my son, I'm a beautiful mother. In the eyes of my husband, I'm a beautiful wife. So when you believe that you are beautiful, when you believe in yourself, you know what to do. I ran after that man, I took my camera, and I said that, repeat it. Repeat it in front of my camera. You called me ugly. <laughs> he couldn't. So I won the battle. Yeah. Use your camera. My camera is my weapon. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love you guys. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. for coming this fantastic event. I would like to ask if everyone could just, for security reasons, be seated until we have Masi out of the room, and then- I love you so, so much! Thank you.